Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome to a new episode of The Life Facebook, A Journey Through Ideology. Last week and over the past couple of weeks, uh, we've been discussing how to prove the existence of God through looking at the perfection of the creation. This week's episode is a very exciting episode because we're actually moving on from the perfection and looking at a different angle of proving the existence of God. Inshallah, I would like to welcome on our esteemed guest, Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Panju. Sheikh Na, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah, habibi min hal. Always an honor. How are you doing this evening? Thank you very much, very well. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. So last week we looked at proving the existence of God by looking at the perfection of creation. But if this is not satisfactory for some people, because sure. we see around the world there's a lot of heated debate, a lot of complicated debate, where people bring in their sciences and all of that. Sure. Are there other ways to prove the existence of God? Absolutely. And um, just a quick uh, uh, pointer on the ishkalat or the objections, uh, the objections that we face. Um, from last week and the week before, we said that for the person who is actually seeking the truth, uh, contemplation over the perfection within the creation in itself is a strong enough proof. Uh, objections that come forward like science, is it science or is it God, for example? Yesterday or last week, we tried to establish that science is a system created by God. And in fact, studying science brings a person closer to God rather than away from God. Just having said that as a pointer, um, you find that within the text, Hakul Yaqeen, Sayyidah Shabbar Rahmatullah Alayhi, when he completes the chapter on proving the existence of God through pondering over the perfection within the system of creation, he comes to a second type of proof, mm -hmm. another way in or another way through which the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal can be established and this is known as the proof of fitra. Okay. And uh, this is actually a proof extracted from the Holy Quran, in particular Surah al rum verse number 30, uh -huh. where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if we were to go through the verse of the Quran, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. فَأَقِمْ وَجْحَكَ لِلْدِّينِ حَنِيفًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's a context in which this verse is revealed and the context in just in terms of the chronology. Mm -hmm. The verse is prior to verse number 30 in Surah al rum Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, granting arguments to the mushrikeen mm -hmm. towards the oneness of the Creator. Sure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes forward with examples and with logical arguments in order for the mushrikeen to think over, pond over and correct their belief system. So within this context, you find within verse 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Fa'akim wajhaka liddini hanifa. Mm -hmm. Direct your attention towards the upright religion. So over here, the word wajhaka, your face, yani a metaphorical usage of the word your face, yani turn your face towards the right religion. The face over here metaphorically denotes turn your attention. Yes. Definitely. Turn your attention towards the upright religion. Liddin Hanifa. Okay. The deen which is Hanif, yani upright, virtuous. Now you will find over here Bain al Qawsain between brackets that the Deen Hanif was a common terminology that was used by those people or to refer to those people mm. before the Bi'tha of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam who were actually monotheists. Uh -huh. So you find that even before Rasulullah made the declaration of Risala in this event, this grand event or celebration known as the Bi'tha, there were a number of people who within the Arabian Peninsula were monotheists. Mm -hmm. So one of them, for example, Abu Talib, yeah. a believer 
in the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have sufficient proof that shows that Abu Talib Salamullahi Alayhi was in a state of intidhar. Ajeeb, in a state wow. of intidhar. Wow. How you and I, we are wow. supposed to be in a state of intidhar, in a state of waiting for the Imam al Imam Zaman of our time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sayyid Abu Talib was also in a state of intidhar, in a state of awaiting, but awaiting for the final messenger of Allah Azza wa Jal. Yeah, yeah. And there is enough and sufficient Qara'in indicators and indications from historical text, his behavior and his words that he was in a state of waiting. The same is applicable to Sayyida Khadija, Ummul Mu'mineen alayhi salam. She was never a polytheist or, uh, or, uh, or from the Mushrikeen. Mm. Uh, another example is uh, Sayyidina Hamza, yeah, yeah. Asadullah Rahmatullah. For example, he was from one of the monotheists. Mm -hmm. And you find that, again, this just came to my mind, even though it's not a part of the discussion, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think discussions like these are important. Mm. It gives us value and it adds on to the bigger picture. You may have seen, for example, uh, the movies that are made about Rasulullah. Yeah, yeah. And you find one, for example, The Message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you may have seen it in, this, in multiple <laughs> a languages. Thousand times. <laughs> uh, of course, and I think the one in English, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, I think the actor Anthony Quinn was playing yeah. as the character for yes, Hamza. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Hamza, rahmatullah alayhi. And you find that when Hamza declares, like in this, in this movie, The Message, when Hamza declares his oneness mm. and his Tawheed, you find that one of the people who object, for example, was Hind, mm. Laina. And you find that in the movie, she's talking about and she's saying, who would wonder that along these lines, who would wonder that Hamza would become uh, a monotheist and profess to the religion of God when he was a person who hunted lions and drank wine? Mm. Abadan la. Hamza was never a person, Asadullah wa Asad Rasulih yeah, yeah, was yeah. never known to have drunk alcohol or to be a polytheist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a difference between announcing your faith and concealing your faith up till the right time. But we have within our tradition that these individuals from the Bani Hashim uh, were people who were on the Deen al-Hanif. Yeah. Yani, they were in this upright religion, uh, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to within this verse of the Quran, fa'akim wajhaka lid-deeni hanifan. And they were known as the Hanafiyin, for example. So they were the Muhajin, basically. They were the uh, monotheists. Monotheist. And uh, you find that upon this verse, the next word that says is Fitratallahi Lati Fataran Nas Alayha. Mm -hmm. Turn your face towards the upright religion, mm -hmm. which is the fitra that Allah has placed inside of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what is this fitra, inshallah? We'll inshallah, look at it. Um, we'll answer that after the break. I do want to remind the viewers if you do want to call in and ask the Sheikh a question, you can call in on 0203 515 Alternatively, you can WhatsApp in your questions in the number down below. Inshallah, we'll see you after Adhan and Salah. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the second part of the Life Faith Week, a journey through ideology uh, with Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Panjou. Sheikh, so before the break, we discussed, um, you know, the ways we looked at of proving the Creator through the perfection of creation. Sure. Uh, we looked at the Hanifs, the monotheists, uh, back in, before the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. And you, just before we ended, you brought it to the uh, topic of the fitrah. Right. What is the fitrah exactly? Right. 
So you find that um, Sayyid al-Shabbar in his book Hakul Yakin, and you find that <clears throat> majority of the scholars in Ilmul Kalam, uh, the Shia Imamiya, mm -hmm. refer to the Dalil of the Fitra to prove the existence of God. Mm -hmm. So, and the verse that is quoted is from Surah al Rum, verse number 30. So if we were to go over this verse, just as we did before the break. So turn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَكِمْ وَجْحَكَ لِلْدِّينِ Hanifa." Uh -huh. Turn your face or turn your attention towards the upright religion. فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا This virtuous religion, deen, which is marked by monotheism, the center of the deen being monotheism, it's a fitra of Allah that He has placed within the people. لا تبديل لخلق الله ذلك الدين القيم. That is the upright and the correct religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now the question is, what is this fitra of Allah mm. that He has placed within the people? And what is its relation to this Deen al okay. Or, uh, yeah, Deen al -Qayyim. What is this? The fitra, in terms of definition, right? You find that to give you an idea, it's this innate instinct within man yeah. to believe in God. And you find that scholars have come across and they have multiple definitions for fitrah. One of the scholars come forward and they say, Iman bi tawheedillah alladhi jubila alayhi al-insan. It is your core, innate, pure uh, belief in Allah Azza wa Jal that's a part and parcel of your soul. Uh -huh. Your belief in God which is engraved into your very essential being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This feeling or this belief in God is affected and is distorted due to the surroundings and the people we meet with and the ideologies. But this, this innate feeling inside of us, you can almost say like this instinctual feeling within yeah. us, like a default setting. So it's like it completes our soul. Doesn't complete our soul. It is a belief yeah. that is deeply rooted within us by default, if uh -huh. I could say that. Okay. Think about a computer with default settings. And then you come change something. And then you come change something. Ahsantum. This, if you could use this term, the default setting with which Allah Azza wa Jalla created us, fitra, is to believe in one God. And then furthermore, وَهِيَ قُدْرَةُ الَّتِي بِهِ تُحْسَلْ مَعَرِفَةَ اللَّهِ Okay. It is this inbuilt feature, mm. power, that allows us to comprehend and seek the ma'rifah of Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay. So this innate feeling within us is known as fitra. Mm -hmm. Centralized within our heart and within our mind, mm -hmm. this defect thing, uh, belief system, in itself is the proof of existence of Allah. Now somebody might come and they might ask you, what is the proof that my default setting was that I believe in one Allah? Very good question. Maybe somebody will say, oh, my default setting was two gods, or my default setting was Aslan, I don't believe in two God. See, because... Just now, the atheist will come forward and say that people are born without faith. It is only when you are brought up in a Muslim house, you become a Muslim. If you are born in a Christian house, you become Christian. If you are born in a Hindu family, you become Hindu. But generally speaking, there is no God. It's all science, for example. The environment leads you towards a faith. So the originality is non-faith. Pushed towards faith. faith yeah, yeah. And in our traditions, we have the opposite. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad says, Every person is born a monotheist, believing in one God. Yeah. 
However, it is the family and the surroundings that then make him into a polytheist and a this and that and non-faith and atheist. Yeah. See, total opposite claims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, how do we know which claim is right and which claim is not right? Over here, we come back to the hadith. And you find that Sayyidah Shabbar Rahmatullah Alayhi, he talks about this tradition narrated on authority of Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam in the tafsir of this verse of Surah Al-Rum verse number 30. Mm. Sayyid Shabba mentions this incident where a person came to Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam and asked him to prove the existence of Allah. So you find Imam al-Sadiq uses the proof of the fitrah, this inbuilt innate feeling within us, belief within us in a higher power, in a God. How, Imam Sadiq said to him, have you ever been in a situation where you were on a boat? Yeah. In the middle of the sea or in the middle of the oceans. Yeah. And suddenly you were engulfed by a storm. Waves and cyclones and winds from every direction. And you felt at that point that your ship or your boat will not survive through the storm. Yeah. In fact, you may drown and you may die. Have you ever been in such a difficult position in your life? When you're traveling in a boat like this? The person said, of course. Yeah. And it seemed that Imam Sadiq salam, knew that this person travels a lot by sea. So he would be able to relate to the example. Mm -hmm. so this is the point. The Imam used an example which this person would be able to relate to in order to prove the existence of Allah. This person said, yes, I've been in a situation like this before where the boat was about to capsize and the storm and the everything doing. Yeah. Imam as sadiq says, at that point, when you were so hopeless and it was absolutely, it, w it seemed that it's absolutely sure that you're going to drown and the boat is, is going to capsize. Did your heart call out to a certain power? Oh, yeah. And did you say, I wish I can be saved from here? I've, 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 uh, the, there's been atheists, for example, who oh. say, for example, oh my God. <laughs> They'll be like, oh my God. And I'll be like, what God are you referring to if you don't believe in it? Subhanallah. <laughs> Ahsan to him. That's, that's actually, that was actually one, uh, something that happened on television. Right. Where, um, he was actually one of our Shia brothers. Right. He's very famous. I won't mention his name. He was debating one of the elite, very, very big atheist. Uh, sure. Very well-known person. And when the audience were asking him questions, he's like, oh my God. And he was like, well, what God? Subhanallah. You don't believe in God. Subhanallah. So who are you calling up to? Subhanallah. And the same thing, you find this. It's, you see, this is what the fitrah is. Yeah. In times of difficulty... It is within the nature of man that he will seek for some intervention by some great lord or some great power. You notice this, even within children, whether they are religious or they are not religious, mm -hmm. huh? Say, for example, now the results for the examinations are coming out. So, for example, GCSE results are going to come out. Mm -hmm. Everybody is freaking out. Even the person who doesn't pray. On a daily basis, probably doesn't even believe in God, does not even think about God. At the time that exams are coming, you see, subhanallah, suddenly he's more compliant with the religion, reciting yeah, yeah. salat on time, maybe no, going yeah. to the church, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. I hope, you see the student, praise, 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 I hope I pass. This prayer, this hope, this inside feeling within you that there exists a greater power. Mm that can change your destiny, that has control over your destiny. Imam al sadiq says, the Quran says, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, that instinct and that feeling in itself is the greatest proof of the existence of God. Otherwise, wow. why would you have this unexplainable, deep, in-depth instinct to call out to a Lord? Wow. Or to call out to a power. Never thought of it that way. Subhanallah. You find that this is why we say our faith and the teachings of our faith need to be taken from Ahlul Bayt. Mm -hmm. You could have, with all due respect, a number of 
high level intellectual discussions on proving the existence of God and philosophical theory not necessary to prove the existence of God because the Imams come forth with the most simplest of arguments that are yet the most convincing of arguments to prove the existence of God. Even an atheist, even a person who claims to be an atheist, at the end of the day has this innate feeling yeah. and need to subscribe to a belief. This is fitra. He says, I don't believe in anything. He says, I'm faithless. Now, now you have a number of people that you speak to, they'll come and they'll tell you, I'm a faithless person. I'm non-faith based. Mm -hmm. Baba, I don't believe in anything. <laughs> that statement in itself is a fallacy. When somebody comes and tells you, I don't believe in anything. I don't believe in anything. That statement is a fallacy. Meaning what? You believe that you believe in nothing. <laughs> True, when true. you say, I don't Very believe in point. anything, that's a belief. Very Your belief point. is that you don't believe in anything. Yani, uh, there is a, a, a mughalata. It's yeah. a mughalata. It's a fallacy in the way that you think. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Imam al-Sadiq says, this innate feeling within the human being to reach out to a higher power in terms of need, in terms of distress, yeah. this power within us or this voice inside us, this ability within us to comprehend and to actually want to subscribe to a belief is the greatest proof of the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal. In fact, there was one of the uh, books of Kalam that I was looking through and... Uh, uh, in this book of Kalam by uh, Marhum Ayatollah Sayyid Ismail Sadr Rahmatullah yes. Alayhi uh, One of our greatest uh, scholars mm. uh, Within the Ghaibah of the Imam He says that proving the existence of God Is like trying to prove something so simple uh -huh. Sometimes it almost becomes absurd Wow. It's like trying to prove that it is daylight by using a lamp. <laughs> yeah. You want to prove it's day, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? You want to prove that light exists, yeah. but you are bringing another light to shed light on that light. Make sense? Makes sense. No, this doesn't make sense. No, as you like would, your point makes sense. Uh -huh, the yeah, point yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 of the not. point of uh, Sayyid Ismail uh, Sadr, Rahmatullah Alayhi, makes sense, of course. But he's saying, look at how simple the issue is, which has been unnecessarily complicated in many ways. A person, when he tells you, I believe that it was Mother Nature that created this universe. What is it within you that compels you to have a belief mm. that it's Mother Nature? Yeah. That compulsion within you shows you the necessity of the existence of a power. Now we need to guide and we need to see who is this Lord. Many times you'll be surprised when you look at the arguments that people come forward uh, about Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. We touched upon it very, uh, I think, just in, in passing. Yeah, 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 but you see the proponents who come and tell you that Mother Nature is responsible for the creation of this earth. If you actually look at it, in many ways... They are referring to the sifat of Allah Azza wa Jal. But describing Mother Nature, if you are to tell them, Ya Be, this is not Mother Nature, this is Allah Azza wa Jal, mm. you find that the equation totally changes. Mm. And therefore, this fitra in itself, you find like the way Allah Sayyid al-Shabbar says, and like the way a number of the ulama of Ilmul Kalam say, this fitra in itself is the strongest, greatest proof such that if you were to contemplate over this, you would not even need to contemplate over the perfection within the creation to prove the existence of Allah. Yes, the issue Allah. is as simple as the issue of the fitrah. Yes, and you find that when you go over this tafsir of the Quran in regards to 
the fitrah. The tafsir that I'm using over here of the Quran. Yeah. Takribul Quran, this is the title of the tafsir. Takribul Quran ilal adhan. Yani making the meanings of the Quran much closer to the mind, make it easier to understand mm -hmm. for the mind. Sure. And um, this is a tafsir that was uh, authored by Ayatollah al Uthbah al Imam Sayyid Muhammad al Shirazi. And his commentary on this verse is very interesting. Okay. For Surah Al Rum, verse number 30. فَأَكِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلْدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسِ عَلَيْهَا Until the end of the verse. He goes on to say that in regards to the fitrah, right? This innate feeling inside of us and this need and this instinct to believe in a faith. Mm -hmm. This faith that revolves around the oneness of God. Yeah. You see that the end part of the verse says, لا تبديل لخلق الله ذلك الدين القيم ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون. The Sayyid he says he describes the fitra in a very uh, beautiful manner using a beautiful analogy. He says because the man is created, mm. right? Is yeah. a creation. Think about it as a product that is manufactured. Every manufactured product, mm -hmm. in order for that product to perform to its optimal capacity mm -hmm. and function in the right way mm -hmm. for what it was manufactured, it has to work according to the manual book. It has to be set up as per the manual book, the yeah. guide, the operation guide, or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. If you start to operate a manufactured item or commodity or try to troubleshoot it in a manner other than the manual book, what happens to the product? It becomes corrupted, it becomes spoiled, it becomes broken, it ceases to function in the way that it was planned. Unless you're Iraqi, then you'll find a way to get it to work. Allah. Without the money, we just throw it out and just get to work. We <laughs> assemble the product first, and after we have messed it up, then we go back to the <laughs> manual and see, ah, oh, what was written over there. Not only Iraqi, Habibi, lots of people. Oh, all over. okay. <laughs> I thought we were on our own in the world. Uh, Allah, you'll be surprised, subhanAllah. <laughs> Uh, sometimes even idarat al muassasat al diniya like this. Oh, okay. <laughs> sometimes even when it comes to uh, running and maintaining and managing and uh, spearheading Islamic institutions, subhanAllah, it's like this. Everybody wants to use their own opinion and when they yeah. drown the people and the community, then we go and say, okay, what did the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt say about yeah. that? <laughs> Fa, anyway, uh, <laughs> subhanAllah. Fa, he gives the example of the manual. He says, if you do not refer back to the manual, then the product in itself or the commodity in itself fails or does not operate to its optimal capacity or for what it was manufactured. Okay. Sayyid al-Shirazi says the same thing in regards to man. A creation created by Allah Azza wa Jal. So as a creation, yani instead of manufactured commodity, put in the word creation. Mm -hmm. So as a creation, human beings have a manual book mm -hmm. which they are supposed to refer back to in order to ensure that they function optimally and are able to fulfill the purpose of the existence they are able to fulfill the purpose of their existence. They are able to fulfill the reason for which they were created. Of course, of course. If they do not refer back to this manual book yeah. and they start following other manual books, mm. abandon this manual book altogether, then there is fitna and fasad in the earth. This manual book here is what the Sayyid uses in, this, uh, in his tafsir, this analogy to show the fitrah, yani belief in Allah Azza wa Jal and belief in this deen al-qayyim, upright religion, the religion of Islam mm -hmm. is this manual book for human beings which if they refer back to, they are able to live their life in the right way. Of course, of course. Uh, so, 
Shekhna, um you talked about someone, if someone didn't want to, when someone talks about not believing in anything, that they're actually believing in something. Sure. Is there a loophole? Can you not believe in anything at all? The fact that you don't believe in anything and you attest the fact that you don't believe in anything, that in itself is a type of belief. Mm -hmm. When you say, I don't believe in anything and I firmly stand by this principle, it means you believe in something. Of course. Yani you believe that you believe in nothing. Yeah. And this is where we said it becomes a logical fallacy. In yeah. Elm al Mantik, it's known as a, as a void argument. Mm -hmm. And you find that a lot of people uh, fall into the same trap. And this is why, Bain al Qawsain, while we are on the tafsir and understanding this Dalil of Fitra, you find for this reason, you find that a lot of people in a lot of the debates and the arguments that you formulate, particularly when it comes to issues of religion, they fall into these categories of mistakes. Yeah. There was one time, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Marj al-Kabir said Abu al-Hasan al-Isfahani, rahmatullah oh. alayhi, and uh, there was a delegation of communists that came towards him. And the communists were of the opinion at that time, they came to meet Sayyid Abu al-Hasan al-Isfahani and the majority of these thoughts by the communists and so on and so forth, they came from these colonial and imperial states. Mm -hmm. And it is through this sort of uh, uh, ideology that they attempted to corrupt the Islamic fiber yeah. uh, and the ideology within the people. So in addition to not only robbing their, their resources, they also rob them of their ideologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they would come and in one of these meetings they came to uh, Sayyid Abu al-Hasan al-Isfahani rahmatullah alayhi and they said to him that we do not believe in the concept of an ultimate single truth. Okay, interesting. There is nothing like an absolute single truth. Rather, everything in regards to reality is relative. There can be multiple truths. And this is again another philosophical concept that there doesn't exist one absolute truth. Rather, truth as a concept is something that is relative. There could be multiplicity truths in yeah. truths, meaning that, so for example, if you were to claim there is one God, that is also true. If you were to claim there were two gods, even that is true. If you were to claim there are three gods, even that is true. That's, if you bring is that not paradoxical? Like it's like a it's a paradox, no? In because that you you say there's one God, but then you say there's two. Which one is it? <laughs> they say there's this is the relativity of truth. There is truth in that statement and there's truth in this statement as well. And this was a theory that was being brought in to dilute the power of a single faith mm -hmm. because then the argument and this is this is actually the fundamental the fundamental principle on which many present day models of pluralism are built on okay where they come and they tell you the basis for a pluralistic society yeah a multi faith society and we're not against multi-faith, by the way. Of course huh? not, we're of not course against not. pluralism. No, 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 but not. what we're saying is the brand yeah, 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 yeah. of pluralism that, I that is being pushed forward or the brand of multi-faith and multi-ethnicism that is being pushed. This yeah. is what we're trying to understand. They say that the root for pluralism is that we have to have a pluralistic society because there does not exist mm -hmm. one absolutely true religion. And therefore, religious pluralism is important. So, enter, you don't have the right to say that Islam is right and Christianity is wrong. Or Christianity is right and Islam is wrong. You have no right to say any world religion is wrong. They are all the same. They all hold a certain type of truth. To the extent that the argument is pushed forward that say that every religion, no matter which religion you abide by, mm. Uh, every religion is like a stream okay. that eventually leads to one God. Oh, okay. okay so regardless okay. of whether you're in this religion or that religion or third religion, it's all Yanin of Sushi. Now, this is a concept, the fundamental concept through which a certain type of 
pluralism, understanding of pluralism is branded. Yeah. So again, if we come back to the story, Abu uh, Sayyid Abul Hassan al Isfahani, they came to him and they said, there's nothing like what? absolute truth. Mm. Truth is relative because within Shia faith, you have one absolute truth. Yeah, yeah. La ilaha illallah is an absolute truth. Yeah. It cannot be a relative statement. Aliyun waliyullah is an absolute truth. Yani the wilaya of Amirul Mu'mineen sure. is an absolute truth. There cannot be any relativity about this statement yeah, yeah, yeah. because there is sufficient proof. So anyway, they were of the opinion that nothing in the world in terms of truths mm -hmm. can be absolute. Everything is relative. Mm -hmm. yani it can be, can be not. Sayyid Abul Hassan al Isfahani turned around to this group, delegation of communists who had come, and he said to them, Well, you are contradicting yourself. Ajib. He said, How? He says, The fact that you want me to believe and to succumb to your ideology that there is no truth, absolute truth, but all truth is. Relative and multiple, multiplicity mm -hmm. of truth. The fact that you want me to believe in that, that makes your ideology an absolute ideology. So an absolute ideology, preaching multiplicity, he says that's a fallacy. He says if that's the case, neither I am right nor you are wrong. Mm -hmm. So you do what you want and let me do what I want. That's like saying, that's like saying if I say one plus one is two, and someone else says, no, it's three. We're both correct. You are both correct. Ahsantu. <laughs> and but the, the, the fallacy in the argument is that you are trying to convince somebody that multiplicity of truth mm. is the only concept that is right. That in itself is tanakud. Because you have only one truth, yeah. and that is multiplicity of yeah. truth. But that's a contradiction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's mocking the intellect, Aslan. It will go around in cycles, cycles, it's cycles. It's mocking the intellect, yeah, 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 Aslan. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you find that uh, there are many arguments like these. Mm. That if a person was to think, he would be able to uh, uh, catch the misconceptions within this. So coming back to the text of Sayyid Abdullah Shabbar. You find that in, in this chapter, he yeah. ends by narrating and by mentioning, quoting some of the du'as of Sayyid al-Shuhada, in particular the du'a Arafah. Yeah. Now this is the prerequisite. Again, this has all been an introduction so far, an introduction to the book of Tawheed. So far, what we've done is we've proved the existence of a higher power. Now, whether that higher power is one, two, three, four, this is the next stage of the book. Okay. And what are the sifat? That is the next stage. So mm. far, it's establishing the existence of God. Yeah. Whether that God is one, two, three, four. The point over here is establishing a higher authority that created all of us, that brought us into existence. Mm -hmm. You see, we've been emphasizing on this theme so much that establishing the existence of God is something so simple. Yeah. <coughs> it's not rocket science. Absolutely. Look at the way Imam al Hussein, Sayyid al Shuhada, mm. salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi, in Dua Arafah, look at how mm. he addresses the issue of proving the existence of God. So Sayyid al Shabbar mentions this as the ending note towards this yeah, chapter. Yeah, yeah. في دعاء عرفة إمام الحسين says وكيف يستدل عليك بما هو في وجوده مفتكر إليك how can I use something to prove the existence of a creator when that something which I'm trying to use as a proof to the existence of God in itself is dependent for its own existence upon Allah. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Wow. I am using something yeah. created by God. Yeah. That thing whose existence is dependent on God, I'm using that to prove the existence of God in itself. 
Look at the angle in which Imam al Hussein mm. addresses this issue of the existence of Allah is something that is absolutely straightforward. Wow. And he goes on to say, Ayakun li ghayrika min al dhuhur ma laysa laka hatta yakun huwa al mudhir laka. He says, Is there something else that is so much more apparent mm. than yourself such that I have to use this to shed light on you? Mm. And he says, Is it such a uh, mystery that it has to be unveiled in this manner? Mm. And this is one part that you find that a lot of the people emphasize on and Dua Arafah. Yeah. Subhanallah, Karbala. Karbala is a madrasa in Tawheed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imam al Hussein Azza wa Jal is a madrasa in Tawheed. Of course. Now, sometimes people come forward with their ishkalat and they say, and especially the non Shia, mm. they come and they say, oh, you people place so much importance on Imam al Hussein yeah. that you forget Allah Azza wa Jal. All you do is mention Karbala, Karbala. You people focus on the Imams more than you focus on Allah if Azza they wa read Jal. An, if they read 1% of what happened at Karbala, just 1% of the sermon that Imam Hussein alayhi salam gave, they would actually understand why we stress so much on Karbala and Ahsan why we stress so much on Aba Abdullah. Because I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest with you. I ha I don't know the full sermon of Imam Imam Hussain alayhi salam, but I I know for sure that if I was to go a, a read and understand it fully, right. there's gonna be so many hidden messages there that um, that I, I wouldn't have heard of. of but Sheikh, I do have some questions coming in through sure. WhatsApp. Sure. Uh, Sister Fatima from Dearborn, Michigan, says, "Can the Sheikh give his opinion on how to debate atheists?" Right. Um, again, uh, our uh, opinion on how to debate with atheists has been captured over the last five sessions. And what we would say to the sister is, again, referring back to the style of debate by the Imams. Yeah. This is something very, very important. So going back to texts such as Ihtijaj, for example, by uh, Alama Tabarsi, where mm. he he carries forward all the arguments of the Imams which they use to debate against atheists, studying from the life history of Imam Sadiq Salawatullahi Wasallamahu Alay, where he debated with atheists uh, uh, of his time. Atheism was a rising ideology during the time of Imam Sadiq. And at a more simpler level, using the books of Kalam that are authored by uh, the Shia Imamiya scholars. Okay. But specifically answering the question, if you're going to research this and you're going to target this, Two things, like the one that we said today, the Dalil of the Fitra. If the Dalil of the Fitra doesn't make sense to them, even though it should make sense, but in any case, one is the Dalil of Fitra. The second one is the perfection within the system of creation. Yeah. This, in my opinion, is one of the strongest manners to, through which you can get through to an atheist in this day and age. Mm -hmm. Again, for the sister to remember, the rule of thumb is this, it is a mathematical impossibility yeah. for perfection to occur multiple times by chance. And you can sit down with a calculator and you make an actual uh, calculation yeah. by way of example. What is the chance that, for example, what is the chance that the composition of water being H2O? Mm. falling into that chemical composition. Yeah. What is the possibility that this would happen by chance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number one. And then number two, what is the possibility that this chemical composition that would happen by chance is also detrimental for human life? What is the mm. pos uh, probability of that happening? What is the probability that the earth ended up in this exact distance from the sun such that had we been 20 kilometers closer to the sun, life on earth would not be possible, yeah. it would be too hot. Mm. If we were 20 kilometers away from the sun, freeze. from our cousin position, we would freeze. What is the probability that this would also happen by chance? What wow. is the probability that the rules of gravity formulated yeah. itself in such a way to ensure that life on earth 
is sustained the way that it is? Mm. What is the probability that the laws of density actually came into existence by chance that would allow, for example, for the ships to sail on water and for man to transport themselves? Mm -hmm. What is the possibility or the probability that the entire animal kingdom is formed by chance and their biological composition is such that mm -hmm. their meat is a crucial part of our diet for our growth. What is, the what is the probability that all this happened in chance? And then put it all together. You will get 0.00000. Masha Allah. Maybe even there are not enough of those zeros within that calculator. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just going to show you error. <laughs> ah, santo. Yeah. So, proving the existence of Allah mm. through the perfection within the system of creation, I believe, is one of the greatest manners and the most strongest convincing manners through which uh, the existence of God can be established. Definitely. This way, you, you, you convince those people who believe that creation was by chance. And then, when you move to the next stage and it says, okay, it was not by chance, it was by science or by mother nature, then you come and you ask yourself, okay, who is this mother nature? How did mother nature come into existence? Who put these laws of science into place and this and that until that argument gets you towards Allah. Yeah. And as the author says within the book and as is pointed by Allah Azza wa Jalla within the Quran, the fitrah, you ask yourself sincerely, honestly, See, this is one of the biggest things in any debate, whether it is with an atheist, whether it is in regards to Tawheed, whether it is in regards to Wilaya and the Imama. Mm. One thing that needs to always be kept as a prerequisite is that enter as an individual. You honestly need to be searching for the truth. Mm. If a person is genuinely not interested to search for the truth, then no matter what argument you give them, mm -hmm. they will never change. Yeah. And this is an important criteria, even us in our daily lives. When we, even when we have leave interfaith or yeah. intersect arguments, mm -hmm. intrasect arguments, within the Shia, for example, yep. arguments, ideological arguments, differences that we have, Many times we want to figure out which one is right, which one is not right, where is the truth and where is falsehood. You find that no party is willing to budge. Why? Number, yeah, there's arrogance and everything, but that deep initial requirement, prerequisite in order to get to the truth is lacking, which is what? To sincerely search for the truth, even if that truth mm. goes against everything that you believe in or everything that you've built your life yeah. upon. Excellent. And this is an important thing, I think. And Amazing. inshallah, the sister uh, has the tawfiq, inshallah, inshallah, to not only be successful in her debates, inshallah, inshallah. but uh, to be an ambassador for tashayyu in, uh, where was it? In Dearborn, Dearborn? in Dearborn, inshallah. Inshallah. And my advice for the sister is to go and watch the previous episodes that we did do because uh, sh the, the sheikh actually does go into very much detail on La, how you can it's just debate superficial atheists. this one <laughs> it's just that superficial yeah yeah, yeah. so my base. advice do watch the previous episodes uh, if you have the time to do so inshallah you'll become an expert in debating atheists uh, I'd like to thank the viewers for tuning in to the uh, the live Facebook with myself brother Minhal Khafaji and with Sheikh Mohammed Abbas Panju um, Alhamdulillah, we did get through uh, the objective of, of this episode, which is the second way of proving the existence of God, which is that inner deeper feeling you get when you're in a situation where you feel hopeless. When you feel hopeless, you, f you say, I hope, or uh, please, someone help me. That someone is that inner fitrah, that default setting, as the Sheikh mentioned. Inshallah, we'll see you next week on the live Facebook, A Journey Through Ideology. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.